So um, Fei Fei came to Stanford after um, an, a career where she got her bachelor's degree in physics uh, and then uh, went on to engineering and neuroscience at uh, Caltech. Uh, and uh, I guess you were a faculty member at Princeton and uh, University of... Yeah. Uh, and uh, then came to Stanford uh, a few years ago um, after having launched the ImageNet thing that we've heard several times about that's been such a, a huge driver of progress in deep learning. Um, Fei Fei's also uh, led a, a huge course that uh, reflects the resurgence of interest in deep learning by having uh, 700 students in it who are interested in applying deep learning to vision and artificial intelligence. So um, that really represents a, an amazing transition from, you know, 10, even six years ago. Um, now Fei Fei is uh, coming back to us from a time away working as uh, chief scientist at Google Cloud um, to head up the uh, human-centered AI initiative with John Echemende here at Stanford. And uh, it's a tremendous pleasure for me to introduce her. Uh, she will be talking to us today about that topic, human-centered AI, a case for cognitively inspired machine intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, and uh, thank you, um, um, everyone, for inviting me, and congratulations to my neuroscience uh, colleagues for such an amazing achievement and incredible announcements today. Um, indeed, I just came back from a two-year sabbatical from uh, Google, which I had a great journey and uh, had fun with Greg and colleagues, and it's uh, quite an honor to be here. Um, I'm sharing some of our latest uh, ideas on um, AI with you. And uh, Greg gave me the task of uh, deciding, uh, dealing with this optimism, optimism versus pessimism. So here's my plan. The first half of my talk will be more optimistic and the, the second half will, will, will be the, the glass is uh, half empty. So let's see how it goes. So. Um, my own field of research is vision, so I was trained mo both as a um, cognitive neuroscientist in human vision as well as an um, AI person, computer vision scientist in, in AI. And uh, vision started in animals 540 million years ago. It is one of the oldest perceptual systems of at the animal kingdom. And in fact, a recent theory in modern zoology has uh, hypothesized it was vision that led to the Cambria explosion of animal speciation about 530 years ago and led to uh, generations and generations of evolution and eventually delivered uh, what we know today as the most incredible intelligence system in the universe that we know of, which is the human intelligence system. So vision is very much a cornerstone of biological intelligence. And the field of computer vision is as old as the field of AI. In fact, they're so entangled, I don't think it's easy to even tease them apart. And it's been 60 years. But it's mostly an academic niche field that, um, that a few of us are working on, but not really known to the general public, till what you heard the year 2012. Uh, so 540 million years all the way to year 2012. What happened this year, you already heard a lot today, is that uh, a uh, particular um, algorithm in machine learning, now we call deep learning, called Convolutional Neural Network, won the ImageNet challenge of object classification. And if you haven't heard about what the ImageNet challenge is, is uh, here's an example of an image, and you need to your algorithm needs to um, look at this image uh, for the first time and assign a label steel drum to this image to, to show that you've understood that one of the main objects in the image in the pixel space is a steel drum. 
And uh, image that challenge consisted of more than one million images and a thousand possible uh, image uh, uh, object classes. And uh, um, it was run already for two years. The error rates were relatively high. And then 2012, um, not even the new algorithm, a known algorithm, convolutional neural network with some uh, scaling up of computation and so on, um, won the challenge and significantly reduced the error rate. And really, that was the year that we know of as the, the change of AI in recent history. And um, by the time ImageNet Challenge was run last year as an academic challenge, the, the best winning algorithm was already sort of beating human performance in 1,000 object categorization. Here by human, I meant one daring graduate student at Stanford. <laughs> so, so we heard from many of the speakers, and Greg particularly, that the convergence of three major factors um, led to the AI revolution we're seeing, or the deep learning revolution we're seeing, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the massive scaling of computation, the, the maturing of algorithms, and the availability of mass data. And no matter what you measure in terms of the number of NIPS attendees, or the number of startups here in the heart of Silicon Valley, or the, 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 the real industrial, um, in, industrial world uh, business, AI is just exploding, uh, thanks to the recent effort by this uh, field. But uh, today, um, given this uh, audience, I actually want to go back to history a little bit and uh, tell half of the story in historical context and project to the future about the relationship between AI and cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience. In fact, I think this is a story that is less told than it should be. And I want to unpack some of, some of this uh, past history with you as well as sharing with you the journey we're still taking and where the future is. So let's start from so this is where the first half of the story is uh, where we come from. Um, so there is the known part of the story of where we come from. What, why did we reach this deep learning revolution? And that's the story of the neuroscience inspired AI. As much as we're still building airplanes, but we did got inspired by birds. So when Hubo and Wiesel um, started recording from cats in the late 50s and 60s, they found out, they started putting out a theory of the brain functions like a computational machine, where the early part of the brain processing or the visual pathway um, takes on, uh, respond to simple features like oriented edges. And uh, from that seminal work, well, Hubo and Wiesel went on to win Nobel uh, prize in medicine in 1980s, um, neuroscientists start to piece together some um, models of the visual pathway or, or of the brain, of mammalian brain, which is that um, there is a hierarchy of information processing. It goes from low level features like oriented edges all the way to high level patterns like a, recognizing a cat. And uh, they're organized in cortical columns. And this idea in the early 60s um, gave birth to the engineering side of the work, where the modeling side of the work, where people are starting to play with the idea of perception and then neural network, like we, we saw Fukushima, and eventually the convolutional neural network. So this, this path from a seminal work in neuroscience to eventually what we have today, deep learning, is a more told story of the, of the AI revolution that many of us have heard of. But I would argue there is another half of the story that is less known, and it's just as important, because while neuro neuroscience and then eventually algorithm give rise to the hammers we need, um, there is cognitive science along the way that has inspired us to find the right problems to solve. And this goes back to the beginning of the field of computer vision. 
So this is literally the first PhD thesis of computer vision as a field, and it's by Larry Roberts. And the idea is to um, simplify the whole thing of vision to just interpreting a synthetic block world like this. Larry Roberts um, eventually gave up computer vision, but uh, went on to do great service to the country and was partially involved in starting up internet. But, um, but that was the beginning of the, the, the birth of computer vision. And as a field, we started seeking what is the important problems we need to solve and then how to solve it. So from block world, we went on to look at edges and segmentations and, and, uh, and, uh, um, um, and textures. I cannot tell you how many papers have been written about uh, going from edges to uh, object recognition and hoping that edges was the holy grail or understanding edges was the holy grail of computer vision or, or vision. Um, in a slightly separate uh, parallel effort, the field of computer vision also started looking at 3D structure of the world, more the geometric aspect of computer vision without any semantic understanding. And there, this has led to many important engineering work as well as products. If you ever enjoy Google Street View and if you um, are excited by the self-driving car revolution, a lot of the 3D con construction work in computer vision has contributed to that. And um, there was also a, a budding try of, or, or budding effort of trying to see if the holy grail problem of computer vision is to match match single objects. For example, if this is a sneaker that I I, um, you know, I want to search for. I look at the sneaker and then go to a different scene and trying to find the sneaker. And this, for those of you who, who, who are um, as old as I am, you probably will remember this paper, David Lowe, ICCV 1999, is like the Alex Net paper of the, the, the 21st century. So every single student in computer vision know this paper by heart. And, um, and, uh, if you look at the history of computer vision, this CVPR is our biggest conference in, 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 in uh, computer vision. And the topic distribution of CVPR 2000 is like this. And um, the problem that ImageNet was trying to solve for is false, would fall under object recognition, and it would be here. Most of the effort in computer vision was in low level vision, but there isn't much of a salient topic here. So in a way, the field, uh, since its birth in 1960, has been spending about three, four decades uh, still trying out different problems without really finding a holy grail. And that's also the year I entered grad school. And uh, so, so what happens next? Well, while computer vision was a young budding field, looking at different aspects of visual processing and still finding its, its, its holy grail problem. A quiet, in my opinion, revolution is already starting to happen. And it would take decades for us computer vision scientists and AI scientists to appreciate the pioneering work by cognitive scientists that have started in the 70s. So um, in fact, every paper I'm going to show here in between there are hundreds and thousands of uh, great uh, work. I'll just sample a few that really has started to, um, to contribute to this um, problem uh, of search for the holy grail of computer vision. Um, as early as 1970s, cognitive scientist Irv Biedermann started to um, uh, raise the, uh, the issue of how important it is to understand objects in real world things. This is the pre-PC time that he finds that humans are capable of detecting objects in coherent things faster than objects in incoherent things using stimuli as short as 150 milliseconds. And the experimental setup was incredible using real slide projectors. I won't get into that. But that was a budding work to show that there's something special about real world objects. 
Concurrently, another work by Molly Potter and her colleagues also show that even if you have never seen this series of uh, images ever, and they're presented at 10 hertz, so 100 milliseconds per image, you will still have no problem in detecting where there is a person, which frame con uh, contains a person, where the person is, what he or she is, uh, the, the rough gesture is. So there's something special about object detection in natural things. Fast forward a little bit, cognitive neuroscientist Simon Thorpe published this incredible paper in Nature in 1996, where for the first time ever, he put a time on how fast object recognition or object categorization is. Uh, by using ERP, he was able to measure by 150 milliseconds after the onset of any natural scene, your brain has a differential signal that shows that I'm able to categorize natural objects versus um, unnatural objects, uh, or animals versus, actually in this case, animals versus non-animals. And that was incredible. I remember that it set a lot of uh, excitement in the field of cognitive neuroscience to show that there's something special about objects. And then in the meantime, um, um, Jim's uh, colleague at, uh, at MIT, Nancy Kemischer, and her students started to show not only we can cognitively show that there's something special about object recognition and detection in human cognition, we can find neural correlates in important, um, in important stimuli like human faces and natural scene places. And this work, um, these decades, so I've, I've shown work spanning almost 30 years, all led to a very important realization for the field of computer vision that by late, um, probably the last year of 20th century and the first few years of 21st century, our field recognized that one of the most important problems we need to solve is object recognition. So to solve that, we started to have some early effort of putting together data sets of about 20 object classes or, or at most uh, 100 object classes to start attempting solving this problem. But something is still missing and that's actually um, around that time I became a assistant professor at uh, Princeton and started bugging me is that if we truly believe that object recognition is a holy grail of uh, human vision and also computer vision, we really ought to solve it at the scale that biological vision was solving. And, uh, and in the way, in, in the fashion that biological vision can, can do it. So uh, one of the questions is, how many objects are there? And how are they organized? So again, thanks to cognitive neuroscientists or cognitive scientists, Irv Biederman is probably the only person I know, maybe I'm missing other literature, who actually put a number on the, num uh, on the number of objects that humans can recognize. And he said it's around 30,000 categories. Give or take, I don't know. Um, uh, this number is not a precise number, but he estimated that by the age of six, human, uh, small humans are able to recognize about 30,000 categories of object, and it's a remarkable feat of the human visual system. In the meantime, um, Eleanor Rush from Berkeley has published a seminal work in, in terms of uh, uh, hierarchically organizing our object uh, space in the mind, and that is the work that led to um, um, the, the organization of uh, superordinate basic and uh, a subordinate level object, uh, uh, object uh, structure in the world. And uh, this work led to a really important work that uh, inspired myself, and that's, uh, again, cognitive neuroscientist linguist George Miller at Princeton in the 90s decided he'll organize all the lexicons in the world, um, in the English world, um, into a database called WordNet. And I was actually um, interviewing at uh, Princeton, I remember, in around 2005. And 
uh, first learned about the importance of WordNet, how it really led to a lot of important work in natural language processing, but also learned that uh, they had a side undergraduate project called ImageNet. And uh, the WordNet colleagues told me that it was a project that they just want to find one picture for each WordNet uh, uh, entry to show that, you know, a panda bear entry will will be attached to one uh, picture. And no undergrads wanted to do it, and it was just a kind of a orphan project. And that inspired my students and colleagues and I to decide that um, we will actually organize the world's objects, because, uh, because that was one of the holy grail problems that the, the computer vision field um, was working on and should be tackling. And uh, needless to say, uh, oh, oh, yeah, by 20, uh, 2009, we rolled out ImageNet data set of 15 million images um, distilled from 1 billion images we downloaded from, uh, from the internet and uh, organized in the WordNet uh, structure of 22,000 object classes. And uh, really, you probably, all of you have seen this. Uh, the rest is really history. Um, as the ImageNet uh, challenge progressed, every year the, the, um, the deep learning models get fancier and fancier from, and deeper and deeper from the seven layers of AlexNet to the 152 layers of ResNet by 2016. Um, there was just a watershed of progress. And even though I don't think we should claim object recognition is completely solved, but it really was a collective effort by the field, both computer vision field and the cognitive science field, that 40 years of efforts and, and different journey together uh, delivered us this incredible progress in um, computer vision and object recognition. And uh, for the graduate students who care about how to get their papers accepted, accepted in conferences. Look at this. This is object recognition in 2000, and this is object recognition in uh, 2013 um, in terms of the CVPR topic distribution and number of papers accepted. So it's an explosion. And, uh, and uh, I think, you know, as a, as a computer vision scientist, we're very excited to see this amount of progress. But the real question at this point is where are we going? And I still want to argue, and my hypothesis remains unchanged, that there's a huge role for cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience to play in inspiring the future direction of computer vision and AI. And we need to continue not only to pay attention to the work of cognitive science, but also to collaborate, because uh, because there is a lot more we can uh, we can learn and uh, and 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 be inspired by, and uh, let me just show you for the rest of the talk a few future directions my own students and my lab has been exploring again embedded contextualized in the uh, in in this. Uh, uh, inspiration by cognitive science. So while object recognition is, is a holy grail problem of vision, it's not the only problem of vision or, or only task human vision does. Um, so in fact, my last year of grad school at Caltech, my uh, advisors and I uh, conducted this experiment. It, it still is an incredible um, 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 experiment to show that uh, humans are so good at visual understanding. Here's, uh, if you are our subject, we'll sit you in front of a uh, computer screen and show you a, a, a real world scene that you've never seen before and, uh, and just mask it by a wallpaper looking uh, stimuli so that we can time the amount of time that the, the photo is in, in, in your retina. And then after that, we'll ask you to type how much you've seen, like just type paragraphs, you know. So um, we pay you, pay you $10 an hour, so, but we hope you can type as much as possible. And uh, these, uh, these scenes are presented anywhere between 27 milliseconds, that's like two frames of refresh, um, uh, monitor refresh rate, all the way to eternity, which is 500 milliseconds. That's how fast it is. And uh, here's an example of a result I sampled from. Given this picture, 
by 500 milliseconds. It, people write novels. Like, there's just so much that the human visual system is capable of understanding the, the visual world. You know, not only there's objects, there is activities, there is details, there is mood. Like, you know, the, the, the person sees it's a rough game. It just, this, this experiment continues to inspire me to, to be humble that computer vision hasn't solved the problem of human vision. We are so good at understanding the visual world. But it has inspired to work of my own and, 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 uh, and uh, my colleagues. For example, image captioning is, is a, 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 um, an area of research that's very active in computer vision right now. Of course, you've heard about uh, uh, deep learning methods like uh, convolutional neural network to represent the pixel space and then recurrent neural network like LSTM uh, to, to generate words. And um, my students and I have been um, toying with different kind of image captioning system going from one sentence summary all the way to paragraphs uh, uh, this, uh, describing the scene. So that was partially inspired by a cognitive experiment. But uh, um, I personally uh, benefited a lot from a very, very short cognitive science paper that I recommend every vision student to read. And it's by Jeremy Wolf from Harvard. And this paper is about uh, what do you know about what you saw? And it was published in 1998. It was literally just two pages. But it was just a beautifully written paper talking about uh, human visual cognition. And he, his, the thesis of the paper is, what does the human uh, visual system really get when we open our eyes and see the world? And he said, of course, we get the gist of the scene, and which can be summarized probably in sentences, and the objects in it. But what caught my eye in recent years when I reread this paper is actually the word relationship. So it's, um, again, I'm not the first one talking about relationship today on this podium. Matt has, and his colleagues have been working on relationships. But if you read this paper, you'll know that um, discrete list of objects is not what the human visual system gets when you open your eye. In fact, it's the interaction, the relationship between objects, between people, between uh, actions that really define our rich visual uh, experience. So here's an example, right? Um, it's both pictures shows an animal and a person, but once you look at the relationship between the animal and person, the whole story of the picture changes. And if you were to do an image net task, you would just say llama and person. But that really doesn't do justice to the visual experience that we have. So recently, my student and I have been exploring this idea of visual relationship uh, prediction I'm not going to go through all this, but the, the basic idea is that not only we have a visual model that's looking at uh, objects, but we also have a language module that's looking at the relationship, the predicates between the objects, and then eventually, for example, given an image like this, our model is capable of predicting not only the objects like person, person, shirt, snow, ski, but also um, you know, person wearing shirt, person taller than another person, and a, a person uh, wearing ski uh, on the snow, all these different kind of relationships. This is still early work even for our field, but I think that we need to look beyond the discrete objects that ImageNet has offered and really start paying attention to, the, to, to relationships. In fact, that uh, we uh, soon recognize that these relationships form a nice representation called scene graphs, where the entities and predicates can be, can be formally uh, uh, put together in a graph structure. And while once we realized this, we knew that we needed to go beyond image that our field doesn't even have a data set to work on that can benchmark our understanding of relationship prediction and beyond. So. Um, um, and, and so my students and I started to put in an effort 
about a few years ago that that tries to build a, a data set and knowledge base that look at the compositional nature of uh, natural scenes. So while ImageNet gives one label per scene, uh, we've seen some budding work, very important work that puts a few labels per scene, um, even a, a, a short sentence per scene. But what we really want is um, this new kind of data set called visual genome data set that, um, that is consisted of the compositional structure of the scene. We, um, for example, for each uh, image, um, the, the visual genome um, data set um, will, will give you labels of, um, of these uh, different regions of the, the scene. As well, as well as descriptions, as well as the entire scene graph description of the entire scene. This is just a zoom in of a small part of the scene. A complete scene graph for this particular image would look like this. And uh, in addition, the Visual Genome Project also collects um, about two dozen question and answers of that picture collected from uh, human uh, human workers. So altogether, we have this data set of a hundred thousand images, um, five million plus descriptions, um, a scene graph made of, many many scene graphs made of millions of objects, attributes, and relationships, as well as uh, questions. And and we've been exploring a lot of different kinds of uh, visual understanding tasks uh, given the scene graph representation, including um, image retrieval, and, uh, and, and my favorite recent work is actually image generation using a GAN model uh, using scene graph. So I'm not going to belabor this point, but just want to show you there's a lot of active research going on in terms of trying to understand compositional nature of scenes going beyond uh, discrete object recognition. One more work I feel very um, excited by is my student, Justin Johnson. He's really interested in understanding the detailed compositional nature of the scene. For example, um, in order to truly test if an algorithm understands what's going on in this, in this 3D world, um, we want to test it with un answering an, a question like how many spheres are left of big sphere and the same color as the small rubber cylinder. And it is hard to just build an understanding by statistical um, you know, um, frequency of occurrence. You truly have to understand the different shapes, colors, and attributes and, and arrive at this answer. And again, I'm not going to get into the details of this work, but the idea is that we can take a question, a natural language question like this, parse it into functional programs. And now with that, we can um, take the natural question, parse it into functional program, and then take the pixel information of the scene and uh, uh, use an execution module to arrive at the, at the answer. A little bit of detail, technical detail, the, the, the program generator part of this, this uh, work is uh, a bunch of LS, is a LSTM model. And then the execution um, engine of this work is more like a module network. By the time a natural sentence, um, a natural sentence uh, question comes in and, and become a functional program uh, after the uh, program generator, uh, the, the execution engine takes it in and evaluate each of the functional programs uh, one by one and arrive at an answer. And with this, uh, with this framework, we've tes tested this uh, extensively and our, um, our model is performing as, strong, as strongly as a human um, observer answering these questions. So there is a lot of excitement in this kind of um, structural compositional uh, analysis of, uh, of visual scenes. So, so these are some of the exploration. Um, in, the, in the remaining part, I want to go even a step beyond because so far what I have shown you is that 
there is cognitive inspiration to, f to uh, urge us to go beyond just object recognition and go into the more detailed object um, or, or scene understanding uh, by taking into account relationships and so on. But uh, human intelligence goes beyond that. In fact, my personal hero of one of the contemporary cognitive scientists is Alison Gopnik from Berkeley. And uh, she wrote this fantastic book, The Scientist in the Crib. And uh, she says that, what is going on in this baby's mind? If you ask people this 30 years ago, most people, including psychologists, would have said that this baby was irrational, illogical, and egocentric. Um, having two kids, I kind of agree. <laughs> um, blah, blah, blah. But in the last 20 years, developmental science has completely overturned this, that picture. In, um, so in some ways, we think that this big baby uh, we think that this baby's thinking is like the thinking of the most brilliant scientist because it's constantly exploring and adapting. So um, currently in my lab, uh, inspired by the latest developmental psychology as well as cognitive science work, we believe there are four really important future direction of visual intelligence that is underexplored and needs to... Um, needs to be uh, studied. And I especially hope that in all four of these uh, directions that we can establish more collaborations with cognitive uh, neuroscientists. So the first one is multimodal. So vision, language, haptics, they all come together in the learning and exploration of the world. Um, active embodied learning, we heard a little bit of ro robotics today and that's really important. Curiosity driven learning is, is all about early years of human intelligence and we need to, you know, instead of this whole supervised uh, uh, learning um, uh, environment, we should uh, put more focus on this and also social and interactive learning. So for example, here's just one example of multimodal learning we're looking especially at the relationship between videos and activities and human language. Uh, here's an example of we can use language to resolve understandings of objects in, in, um, in, in a long uh, instructional videos. Without language and without video it was hard to detect say detect this pizza the first try of this uh, algorithm just detected in a more or less in a wrong way but by connecting not only language but also uh, video um, uh, previous frames of video and understanding the previous uh, instructions were able to detect the whole pizza so this is just one example um, in the area of active and embodied learning, my students and I are exploring a number of robotics and vision tasks from manipulation to, um, uh, to uh, simulated learning, um, especially from uh, uh, learning from task structure as well as multimodal learning, uh, both in terms of uh, vision as well in, in terms of physical uh, force. And uh, this is one of my favorite work because uh, it really uh, is led by da Dan Yemens, um, who is, uh, um, I don't know if Dan is here in the audience, um, but uh, who is a, a assistant professor here in the Neuroscience Institute, who has this brilliant idea of uh, curiosity-based learning. And uh, we have been doing this work uh, for the past couple of years. And last but not the least, especially going towards never-ending learning and knowledge acquisition, um, I have been collaborating with Professor Michael Bernstein at, uh, at uh, uh, Computer Science Department to look at how um, a, an AI agent and a human um, can learn in the, in the in an interactive way, in a social way, and continue to accumulate knowledge that is important for an AI agent. So that was a bit of a um, um, quick summary of where, from my perspective, I think the exciting meeting points are between AI, especially computer vision, and cognitive neuroscience, both in terms of a historical perspective as well as where we might be going in the future. And uh, one thing I think that uh, AI has, uh, in 2018, there's no argument that 
AI is not, an, uh, not a transformative field, but what's really the important question is where is AI going? And I feel that I hope to see the next generation of AI technology can be more inspired by human intelligence, not only by neuroscience, but cognitive science and behavioral science. And that's the importance of the interaction between AI scientists here on campus and, uh, and the um, Stanford Neuroscience Institute. And uh, um, just one, one minute is that, um, AI is still a very young field. We've come a long way in 60 years. This is founding father of AI, John McCarthy, one of uh, Stanford's uh, uh, faculty uh, almost 60 years ago, and this is AlphaGo. And, uh, but already it's transforming every single part of industry that uh, we get to observe today and about to transform many ways that human society is going to um, function and look like. So um, I often tell my students and I share with my colleagues, as much as AI's name is artificial intelligence, there is nothing artificial about AI because its impact is real. Its impact is in humans, is in our society. So with that in mind, um, my colleagues, many of the colleagues here sitting in the audience, especially John H. Mundy, we have been uh, working together to start a human-centered AI initiative at Stanford with the goal of establishing a human-centered AI institute very soon to study the future of AI. We've already seen that we believe the first future, one of the important future of AI is its interaction and inspiration and, and collaboration with cognitive and neuroscience. But there are two other very important aspects of human-centered AI. One is that the development of AI must be guided by human impact, whether it's about jobs, whether it's about ethical codes, legal ramifications, cultural changes. It's important to involve humanists and social scientists on this campus and beyond to study this. And then the third one is about the goal of AI should be benefiting humanity, should be enhancing humanity, not replacing it. So we hope that very soon with the collaboration with the neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, and many other colleagues on campus, uh, Stanford will soon assume um, an important leadership effort in bringing the human-centered AI uh, to campus. Thank you very much.